Hi everyone. My name is Mustafa Mukadam and I'm a researcher at Facebook AI Research. Today I'm going to talk about how to design and learn reactive motion policies and get robots to move and do, do things like you see on this slide. Uh, to begin with, let's ground the problem of uh, reactive motion generation. So for instance, in this example, the problem of the robot trying to move uh, away from this obstacle and get towards the goal can generally be described by motion generation, which can capture many things like search, motion planning, uh, reactive policies, things like that. And specifically what makes this problem reactive is at any given time step, you, you know what the state of the robot and the, and the environment is and what is the next best action that you can do to achieve uh, whatever task you're trying to do. Uh, and this, this sort of per time step evaluation is what makes uh, this, this problem reactive. Uh, and in, in general, the, the whole crux of the problem lies in how to design and come up with these policies that can encode the desired task and behavior. And many approaches in literature sort of stem from trying to solve this, this problem. So let's take a look at a few that have been successful so far. Uh, more pro most prominently, uh, there's operational space control that basically deals with the idea of designing these policies as second order dynamical systems. So this, this should remind you of things like uh, uh, PID control where you have some potential function, some damping function, and using this, you can, you can define a policy, let's say that tries to avoid an obstacle or tries to go to a goal. Uh, this should also maybe remind you of dynamic movement primitives where you know, this potential specifically takes a form of a quadratic function centered around the goal and the damping function can be just some constant beta, except in the MPs, what you try to do is learn all the complexities of the behavior in this uh, function F. And so in operational space control, what you do is define a bunch of these different uh, second order policies to do many different tasks. And then you solve a least square problem like this one uh, to find out what the what the action should be uh, for the full joint configuration of the robot. Uh, and naturally, when you think of multiple tasks like these, uh, you, you will eventually run into problems where the policies might try to fight against each other because they have competing objectives. And so a, a natural extension to this, this problem was to introduce weights, which, uh, which would try to balance out these policies. But if you, if you just end up using scalar weights, then the, the question is really just how to come up with these. And, and so if we look at geometric control literature, they've shown how you can actually design metrics that are state dependent. And so because of that, you can induce some extra information in, in these policies so that they can, they can weight, weight the least squares uh, effectively. Uh, and so, for example, in uh, obstacle avoidance, you could say have a policy that is weighted more highly if it's closer to an obstacle and weighted more uh, less if it's away from an obstacle. Uh, and if you sort of extend this to the second order policies that we're looking at, it actually gives rise to an extra term that we didn't have before, which is this C term. And if you, if you look at this whole equation, this should start reminding you of uh, Newton's uh, Newton Euler equation where the M might be an inertia matrix and C might be the curvature or more commonly known as Coriolis, except in that case, that second order equation is describing the dynamics of a system rather than uh, something more abstract here, which is like a behavior of what the policy is supposed to do. So, so we're, we're sort of getting on the right track in terms of using geometric control theory to figure out how to make these uh, metrics or weighting terms slightly more expressive so that policies fight less against each other. But if, if we just look at these uh, state dependent metrics, you still have the problem where, let's say for instance, uh, the uh, robot might be super far away from the obstacle but moving towards it. And in that case, you still want the policy to be active. But if you're just looking at the distance away from an obstacle, maybe it might not be because of the way it's formulated right now. So, so the central question we wanna discuss uh, in this talk is 
how do we leverage these geometry principles to more effectively design these policies? And can we induce some kind of structure through those policies so that uh, learning can become more efficient? And so let's, let's start with the first question. Uh, I'm specifically going to talk about uh, our work on Ramanian motion policy flow. And uh, I'll, I'll sort of give a high level overview of two key ideas that enable us to uh, you know, design more expressive policies. So one is something that operates on a policy level and another one that looks more at the, at the cluster of all task policies that need to be combined. So let's, let's start with the first one. So in, in, this, uh, in this slide, we have this same second order equation that we were dealing with before. And the question really is, how do we induce the right uh, curvature in, in the environment so that we can design this M function? So for instance, this uh, robot needs to avoid this obstacle here. And we'll specifically focus on this end effector for now. And what we really want is uh, the, the curvature of the underlying environment to be such that just by designing this metric, you automatically get a policy that you know gives you these orbiting behaviors around the obstacle. So you're you're sort of naturally inducing a curvature in the environment, and the obstacle just basically punches a hole. And what would constitute a sort of a smooth straight line trajectory in some Euclidean space, now projected back to our real world environment, is is uh, is sort of described by this M, which is a Riemannian metric and naturally induces these orbiting behaviors, which turn out to be geodesics in, in that uh, metric space. And so uh, that's, that's what we get with this uh, uh, designing a metric that naturally curves the space. And then what we can do is uh, sort of design simple potential and damping functions so that we can get the right obstacle avoidance behavior. So it, it turns out that if we actually go beyond geometric control theory and add not just a position dependent metric, but also a velocity dependent metric, we can actually achieve exactly what we were talking about with the obstacle avoidance example. Uh, of course, by doing that, some of the stability properties break. And so it involves a bit of analysis to figure out how to adjust this uh, new curvature term so that the policy still remains stable. But then in general, the idea is still that you would solve these least square problems and have multiple policies that are slightly more expressive and fight less against each other, just because we have uh, a metric that's more expressive. Uh, and so, th and then the second thing we want to do is induce the right structure. And that again, stems from uh, geometric interpretation. So if we, if we look at this uh, least square problem here, uh, oh yes, so RMP is basically defined as just this tuple of uh, acceleration and metric that we've designed and for this uh, specific policy. And it could be for any number of policies. And, and so if you look at this least square problem as a, as a graphical visualization, what we see is a very flat tree structure where your root node is the configuration space that maps to different task spaces uh, XI and in these uh, projected task spaces, you can define your RMP that governs a specific behavior. So something like obstacle avoidance or goal reaching. Now, the interesting thing is that there's a lot of uh, structure in, uh, in robots. So we can actually leverage the robots kinematics or even abstract uh, spaces like uh, distance of a end effector to a goal or something like that. So instead of a flat tree, we can actually use that structure to make things more efficient. And in practice, what it turns out to be is a much more complex, but big tree that you can uh, leverage the, the computation on so that uh, it, the overall policy calculation is way more efficient. So when, once you have this tree, the actual algorithm becomes quite simple. And it just involves these three steps, uh, starting with you know, forward pass through the tree, where you start from you know, the, the root, root nodes state and go all the way to the leaves, evaluate what the states are there, and then at the leaves where the RMP policies uh, live, you evaluate what those policies are and then start combining them 
in a recursive backward pass until you get back the, the policy at the root that you need to apply. And so it results in a very simple yet efficient algorithm. Of course, the, the hard part about this is how do we come up with those policies, which we will take a look at next in, in terms of uh, learning them and actually leveraging this structure in the process. So uh, with this RMP flow, what we were able to do is uh, uh, have very complex uh, manipulation systems interact with uh, real world objects and uh, take real perception inputs, uh, as you can see in, in this uh, video over here. Uh, it, it uses a system called uh, DART that uh, tracks uh, the, the object states and the robot state, and then uh, gives instantaneous feedback for the, the overall RMP system. We, we also extended this to some multi-agent systems here as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, and uh, be, beyond our own work, uh, there are a bunch of uh, other recent uh, works as well that have uh, used this uh, RMP infrastructure to uh, solve various kinds of uh, manipulation and navigation problems. So coming back to the question of, uh, once we've designed these policies, how do we actually learn them? Because coming up with each of those by hand can be quite difficult. Uh, so in, in one particular work, what we did was uh, we looked at this tree structure and thought about how do we make the policy combination a bit more uh, flexible. And in, 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 in some sense, uh, if, we, if we look at a small uh, uh, location in the tree with uh, some parent node and some child nodes, uh, what we can do is add some scalar weight function at each of these edges that tell us how the child node policies can be combined into the into the parent policy. Uh, of course, these weight functions uh, need to be functions of their parent state. If they're a function of the, the child state, then those weight functions can directly be absorbed into the Riemannian metric for the policy itself and wouldn't lead to anything meaningful. And so the, these weight functions that depend on the parent state introduce uh, sort of this extra flexibility in uh, telling us how do we combine these uh, child policies into the parent policy and in, um, in some sense uh, allow us to make policies more expressive by uh, breaking down a complex policy into some smaller chunks. Uh, and of course, the, the most interesting thing here is that since this whole forward backward pass through the tree, the actual algorithm is fully differentiable. What we can do is uh, design these weight functions to be uh, uh, just a, a feed forward neural network that can be combined and then uh, learned end to end. And so this is what we do in this uh, specific paper. And because of this fully differentiable architecture, we can train these weight functions on some kind of imitation loss, let's say, and still use the system's uh, guarantees on, uh, on stability and things like that, uh, even, even during the training process. So for instance, uh, let's say for this example, we had some expert demonstration like this one. What we can actually see is that not only does the policy uh, remain safe uh, at the at the end of training, but we can also guarantee safety just because of the way these policies are designed. And we can also ensure stability uh, as the, the, the energy term uh, sort of monotonically goes down while you are uh, progressing through the training process. And this is this is basically because we're not using just kind of some feed forward networks that go from uh, sensor inputs to actions directly, but we actually have this uh, uh, RMP tree structure in there that uh, encodes how the policies need to interact. And so you can only focus on things that uh, do not violate any of these, uh, these safety or stability uh, properties. And, and of course, uh, we can uh, apply those policies on a real system as well. Uh, another more recent work we looked at uh, that that was just uh, uh, accepted at NeurIPS this year is uh, is sort of on a similar idea, but in the context of reinforcement learning. So in in this case, uh, you you might have seen traditional approaches uh, sort of use uh, uh, state inputs and some deep uh, deep learning policy that 
produces actions at every time step. And this is sort of like the standard RL setup. Uh, what we try to do here is uh, actually induce uh, some structure in this deep learning, uh, deep neural network policy through, through our second order policies that we had been using. So something like a DMP or RMP in this case. Uh, specifically here, what we did was just use a DMP and uh, have neural networks actually learn uh, this uh, goal G and the, the function that you typically learn through, uh, through imitation learning. Instead, we learn it through reinforcement learning here, uh, this function F. And uh, what this allows us to do is because this policy can be fully differentiable, we can have sort of the learning part of the, the, the policy, predict these instantaneously at any new time step. And so in essence, uh, this, this sort of architecture allows you to generate new policies every, every time step or every K time steps as, as you progress. And so that's, that's sort of what we did uh, in, in this work where instead of generating just one action from one DMP, we generate sort of uh, uh, K actions from the same DMP. And then when we go back, uh, we can have a completely new DMP parameterize some new actions. And in, in, in sort of this way, we can have more expressive policies that not only need to govern the entire trajectory, but can operate on smaller, smaller chunks across as you, as you do the task. And, and so what we did was we compared it with sort of uh, state of the art reinforcement learning methods on many different uh, tasks like uh, throwing and picking and things like that, that uh, typical RL papers look at. Uh, in, in this instance, uh, we, we looked at some tasks from the meta world uh, data set as well. And uh, what we see is uh, that, that our method that incorporates this sort of dynamics uh, policy structure is in many tasks able to learn uh, the, the, the policy much quicker as well as uh, have uh, better success rates as well. As well. Uh, and uh, here are some uh, interesting examples on uh, sort of the qualitative results as well compared to a PPO baseline. Of course, this PPO baseline also takes multiple actions uh, to keep things fair. And so what, what we saw was that we can actually leverage geometry in, in interesting ways in, in both sort of designing better policies as well as inducing structure in the form of trees uh, uh, to, to sort of induce, induce a, a useful structure that the policies can be easily designed and then actually subsequently leverage that structure to uh, do end-to-end -end learning of these policies in sort of more data efficient ways. Uh, so I just want to list these uh, papers that I talked about here and acknowledge uh, all my uh, collaborators on, on these works. And uh, before I end, I want to introduce the next speaker, Luigi Malaco, who is a PI and group leader at Romanian Institute of Science and Technology and works on topics like differentiable ge differential geometry, optimization and machine learning. Thank you.